You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagon Yedele and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Body Banter. My name is Shegbo Yedele, and I am speaking from the traditional unceded and ancestral territories of the Silk Okanagan Nation, also known as the UBC Okanagan Campus. And today, uh, as usual, I have with me Claudia. Hi, Claudia. Hi, Shagan. So nice to be here with you again. And I'm joining you from the traditional unceded and ancestral territory of the Musqueam Nation, also known as the UBC Point Grey Campus here in Vancouver, Canada. I have a guest right here in my office with me. Let me introduce you to Sunit. Hi, Sunit. How are you? Hi, Claudia. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Uh, I just uh, flew down 10 days ago. And there's 10 more days to go. I'm exactly at the midpoint of my stay and I can already find myself grieving because I don't feel like leaving this place. It's been nothing but warm and welcoming and yeah, it's just amazing to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're so happy to have you here. Tell us about where you're from. So you teach anatomy yes, in India. So tell us more about your school and, and what you teach and how you teach. Wow, good. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a long answer. <laughs> so I'm from Pune. It's a, it's a city in the state of Maharashtra in India. And uh, Pune is actually one of the hubs for education. There's a lot of universities and colleges in Pune for uh, higher education especially. And my parents uh, were doctors, um, both mom and dad. Mom's a gynecologist, dad's a dermat. And uh, there was always this, uh, this pressure for at least one of the kids should probably become a doctor, you know, and like run my that was dad's you. clinic. Well, my brother was good at math and I was bad at math. So <laughs> it was more of a process of exclusion. I was like, oh, okay, well, my brother's good at math. And I, I think I had better memory maybe. And I, I, I loved biology more than math for sure. So I did bio and in India, uh, after doing two years of bio, you, you know, apply for the, I mean, you enter the, uh, entrance, the highly competitive entrance examination for, it's called MBBS in India. Uh, that's uh, undergraduate medical studies. And uh, it was great, but nothing felt like first year. We do anatomy in first year. So I was uh, was exposed to uh, one of the coolest teachers in the university who taught us anatomy. Her name was Dr. Jo Jog, J-O-G. And she was like, very artistic and very creative and I could really resonate with her teaching methods and that probably is one of the most important reasons why I fell in love with anatomy. Shagan, we've heard this story before, right? Like people go into the anatomy lab, they learn anatomy, they have a fabulous mentor, an educator that inspires them. Absolutely. And then they never can Yeah, look and they never them. leave. That's that's my story as well. <laughs> See, it's mine as well. Yeah, it's like what connects all of us here. It's so interesting. Yeah, I never felt the same again in any other lecture or while studying any other subject. And no disrespect, I'm sure every subject in the human sciences is fascinating. But it's the person who, I think it's the person who drives the subject. You know, sometimes if you're just lucky enough, you look at someone very early and you say that, oh, I'd like to be doing that for the rest of my life as well. And I never felt the same kind of passion uh, with uh, with OPDs. And, you know, uh, when when I was addressing patients, I felt a sense of a lack of empathy amongst, uh, amongst the system. And uh, again, I could probably be, you should not just take my word for it. I'm sure there are beautiful places out there back in India where empathy is, it's all about empathy. But where I was and what I went through, I kind of decided maybe, maybe I should start creating doctors instead of becoming one myself. And I thought that was a nice indirect way of still, you know, reaching out to people and helping in the healing process. 
by just making good doctors. You make good doctors and then you improve the health system and that's that's the plan. That's the purpose. That's so beautiful. How long have you been teaching anatomy for? Uh, it's been nine years now and uh, it's been exciting. Uh, there's this other part of my personality that was, you know, staying in hiding for the longest time, which is that of a musician, a singer songwriter. And only lately have I realized that, you know, I could actually bring that side of my personality into the classroom. So since the last two years, I've been walking in class with my guitar and using music and songwriting as a tool to, you know, increase the engagement in my lectures. And the kids love it. They're very happy. And I try to make it as you know, interactive as possible. Choose the songs that they like, just change the lyric a little bit, but use the same melody that's been working for them. Stuff like that. It's been great. I, I love it. That sounds so fan fantastic. So, and so I resonate with that story because one of um, my lectures that uh, Claudia and I created a, uh, a, a module for my embryology uh, of the heart lecture and one of that lecture, um, I created like a song for it. <laughs> and it's been one of the ones that students, the, every student that has passed through embryology and anatomy, uh, we, I see them several years later and, and they remind me, oh, I remember that song. I, I love it. So I can completely relate to, to that story. <laughs> so Sunny, what inspires you to um, create these songs for your students? Like, where does that come from? Uh, well, it actually comes by uh, just going back in time and realizing how I was as a medical student. Uh, perhaps I wanted to be an artist, but there was a lot of uh, dogma around not choosing that as your sole profession. And I can understand why, because the way we consume art has changed so much that you can't just be an artist. You have to have a couple of jobs and balance things around to have a to have a, a financially stable existence as an artist. So when I was in the classroom, I would see my attention swing all the time. And there used to be things that I've seen in a TV show the previous evening that would run in my head. And there would be songs that I'm possibly listening to in the morning that would be going on in my head. And I was really, really excited about the idea that is the brain craving for artists, uh, for art in the middle of an academic endeavor is is it possible that we could introduce and deliver uh, uh, science and academic content through the medium of art so people think that they're not going for a lecture but they're going for like a gig or a performance and that's what I used to be all about like I used to maybe miss a morning lecture because I was attending a gig the previous evening so one day I thought can we make can my lectures be my gigs and can they get sold out? Would that really be a possibility? So I wanted to kind of, and I, I still am very, very uh, hopeful that I can change the system of science education in a way that every science lecture feels like an act, like a performance and like a gig. And everybody wants to attend it. And it's cool to be a part of that. So That's so cool. Um, I wish I could sing and, and play music in that way. Um, but I think it really speaks to something that, Shagan, you and I have talked a lot about and we've talked a lot about it with many people. And that's sort of the power of combining the arts into our everyday life, uh, sort of centering the arts in our practice, um, whether it be through storytelling or through music or through art and visualizations. Um, so I do it through visualizations. Um, and both you and Shagan do it through songs, and um, I think we all do it through storytelling. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that we're all discussing right now as a society, right? Like the importance yeah. of the arts um, in our everyday life as sort of a manifestation of our humanity, Absolutely. right? And Absolutely. sort of starting to integrate these aspects of our life a little bit more rather than siloing and disintegrating. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, well, I truly believe that art is powerful. Uh, there's so much that can be said in such a su such limited vocabulary in in an art form. You know, the, like uh, like a simple chord sometimes speaks and brings out an entire emotion. 
that an entire paragraph of words will not be able to incite. And the funny thing is, I, I'm not even sure if people understand how much they, how, how many of their daily choices and decisions are actually inspired by color and by seeing things and by hearing things. I think we fail to, like, I, I still remember some of the favorite scenes uh, of the my, of my favorite television shows. I can close my eyes and I can just, you know, recreate them. And, and that's probably because there's something about the format in that scene, the visual st storytelling part or the musical background score, whatever's going on in that scene, that really makes it completely like stick, you know? And if we study the science of that art form, that then we could incorporate that art form into the education of science. So that kind of completes the circle. And that's something that, I mean, I understand that this is a very vague thing to kind of streamline into like a proper project proposal, but I would like to spend a limited amount of time. Uh, I mean, it's going to be lifelong, of course, but I'd like to put this into uh, like a more concise manner and maybe just make like a, like a PhD out of it, you know, just try to understand what can be done by understanding the science of an art form and then incorporating it back into science education. So it's something that I really uh, Yeah, that, that sounds like a worthwhile project and uh, I, I, I could collaborate on that kind of research. <laughs> but um, to, to come back to the teaching, um, how do you, what, do you have a process in terms of uh, setting up your class your classroom or your teaching, do you have a process or do you just, is it just by inspiration, whatever comes on that day? Or do you have a plan wow. of incorporating songs into your teaching? That's a great question. That's a great question. So over the last two years, it has been pretty much, okay, uh, get into the room first and read the room because you can read the room. You know, even before people start talking, you know if the students are tired, maybe they had a midterm the previous day, so they'd be a little low on energy. Uh, after reading the room, I've just kind of tried to ask them, so it's been very feedback oriented. Would you guys like to listen to some music in the, I've got a, I'm gonna be talking for 100 minutes now, and I'm not sure, you don't look like you're going to be <laughs> listening to me talking for 100 minutes. So what can I do for you so that you feel a little relaxed and energized. Is there a song I can do? Can it be a, does it need to be a happy song or a sad song? So it's been very feedback based, but it's been very, I mean, to be honest, it also depends on my mood. Sometimes I don't feel like singing at all. And then I'm like, oh, today's just not one of those days. Let's just get back to it and let's just get done with it. But hopefully now, as I'm trying to explore it further, it would be nice to have a process because sometimes to achieve consistency, even in an art form, discipline and planning is so vital. So if I get enough time to reflect on this and I try to write things down, I could actually end up coming with a system that helps me to know exactly when the song needs to pop out and what kind of a song it should be, what should be the harmonic movement in the song, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully by studying all of that better, I'd be in a better position to come up with a process and someday I'll publish it, who knows? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and it's actually, I think it probably would be it, like a midway between the two because all of art depends on just the spontaneity Absolutely. and the and the inspiration of the moment so yeah. i think it might just be you combine like you said some days you just feel okay today, today. also it might be subject dependent yeah but yeah. we're dealing with a really conceptual thing that i really want to get that out of the way before even thinking about any other thing so yeah I think it's probably going to be a mix of, of both process and spontaneity. You do get inspiration just from the subject matter. I mean, thinking about the eye movements here, tell us what happened there. Oh, yeah. So uh, here's a nice little uh, uh, opportunity to compliment Claudia, which I've been doing <laughs> for a while now. But uh, so as soon as I came in, uh, I was lucky enough to attend one of Claudia's lectures and it was one of the most uh, twisted things that really get medical students a little you know bugged up which is the movement of the extraocular muscles and I was sitting at the back bench trying to dissect her process and just try to understand how she goes about it and I was also looking at the students to understand the reactions and the engagement and I mean, I'm sure we could all agree that she's fascinating at what she does. She's a true master. 
Uh, so yeah, I can see her going. Uh, I, I can see her going red now. I can see the the pink, yeah, uh, on her cheeks. But uh, it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. She's incredibly amazing, and she does not even realize it. It does not feel like a thought. Like I said, it just seems very natural that she's a great storyteller. So she was talking about a few things, and uh, I was like, oh, I want to do something that is going to be, you know. Uh, something just as cool. I was like a little fired up and I'm like, okay, I want to do something as well, which kind of incorporates art into this whole studying the eyeball movements thing. And uh, I, I, I was truly speaking, I'm, I've been jet lagged and I've been struggling with, you know, just adjusting everywhere. So I was having a bit of a writer's block. So I tried to like write some lyrics down, but I could not get the right tune. And the same evening I stepped into uh, the local pub. It's called the Legends Pub at Richmond. And a blues band was performing and I got a chance to sing a blues song. So I went on stage and I sang it. And this band is amazing, by the way. Uh, it's called Johnny and the Boys. I think they just made that up when I asked them what the name of the band is. But they've been together for 50 boys. And Johnny, who's like about 60 years old now, he looks at me after my performance and says, Son, you got the blues in you. And that was suddenly like so inspiring that I went back home and I said you know what maybe I'll just try to do a blues bluesy kind of a thing on the lyrics that I've written for the extraocular muscle movements and we have a blues song which is called the extraocular blues can we hear it of course that'd we can. be so cool yes we can The song is partly inspired by uh, a song called uh, Lord Henry. This is from one of my favorite albums of all time. It's uh, uh, You Laurie and the name of the album is uh, uh, Let Them Talk. Life was simpler when you study the movements of the eyeball. Oh, how I wish that life was simpler when you study the movements of the eyeball. But the axis of the orbit don't align with the visual axis. Don't align with the visual axis. Don't align with the visual axis at all times. Rectus causes pure elevation. You know that already. Where well, the eyeball is in full abduction, the inferior rectus causes pure depression. But when they both acting together, they cause the ADD adduction. They cause an ADD adduction. They cause an ADD adduction to the nasal side. <laughs> Oh, 
much fun thank you we're gonna use that in our lectures from here on in Woo. this will be like the famous eye movement blues Woo. thank you so much for having me and <laughs> i'm just so excited to be able to share all my views and my ideas with you and uh, yeah it's 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 a little difficult for people to uh, to listen to you when you have ideas that might be of an interdisciplinary nature because you know uh, as uh, guardians of science perhaps we try to walk by a very straight path and sometimes it feels a little scary to suddenly maybe think that, oh, is there another way to look at this? So sometimes I find myself lonely and since I've been here in Vancouver and Richmond, I have not been feeling lonely at all. I feel that people understand me and that's a big thing for me. So thank you. Oh, that's so nice. And um, I agree, interdisciplinary is, is hard, right? Yeah. And I mean, it requires a bit of vulnerability to kind of put yourself Absolutely. out there and, and sing. And Shagan, you do the same when you kind of bring in your songs. Um, how do you manage that balance between kind of being the professor and showing that vulnerability for, to both of you, actually? Like, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. well, that's a great question once again, uh, because uh, I don't know, sometimes I feel that to be to be good in academia, you have to be very, very precise, uh, very concise, and uh, very. Uh, everything has to be like in a bulleted point form, so that there's brevity and people understand you without having to waste too much of their time. And surprisingly, art is just the other way around. You could like kind of go as tangential as you want and go all around the place. And uh, I try to find the middle ground, and I honestly struggle with it. Uh, lately, what I have been doing is I just try to think of certain sessions where I have to be very, very precise and concise and certain other sessions where I get to, you know, be a little more intimate and uh, be a little more vocal about, you know, uh, adjoining, uh, aligning concepts and stuff like that. So for me, uh, as a lecturer, uh, I have to teach 150 students in a 50 minute lecture. So when I do that, I just come in and I say, listen, I'm, I think I'm going to be very, very concise here. And if you have any questions, just write them down. And we can, you know, wrestle it out later in my office hours. And I have these small group teachings, which are not very small in India. It's like 50 students. But I get a longer time there. I get like two hours with them. So when I have that, that time there's a lot of interaction. And that time they also kind of hear the artistic side of me because I try to, you know, think a little more interdisciplinary and draw some parallels in those sessions. So the, the rule is the larger the number of the crowd you're addressing to, uh, the more concise you need to be and the shorter and the more interactive the module or the situation then try to you know like go all around places but in here there's always the prefrontal cortex battling out with I don't know the the creative and the the creative and the academic part of the brain constantly battling out with each other saying that okay don't say this right now just move on to the next line you know so I can I can hear my brain go like that because I'm talking and an idea comes by and I want to you know use that example but I'm like no there's only 50 minutes left. Just move on to the next slide, you know? So the struggle is real. It is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and I think eventually, though, what um, might be helpful is to know that the students really appreciate some measure of vulnerability. Yes. It just kind of humanizes the professor so they know that they're not they're not a robot. Or they're not just kind of there to <clears throat> lay down the rules for them. So once they see you as a, somebody they look up to, they admire being vulnerable, I think they also just respond very positively to that. So um, that's been my experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah Shagan, I, I couldn't agree more. And it just brought the question into my head for both of you. Do we need to reform academia a little bit to make more space for this? Because we all benefit from it. And it seems like a lot of undergraduate and graduate and health professional education is so rushed, right? We're 
constantly going from one lecture to the next, from one midterm to the next. I don't know that this student experience is necessarily really good for their development as human beings, as um, full rounded individuals, as academics. What do you guys think? I completely believe in this and uh, I, I find myself fighting a <clears throat> battle where I'm on one side and everybody else is on the other. I don't know why, you know, wearing your heart up your sleeve in the classroom is not supposed to be respected because for students to feel safe to make a mistake, to create a secure environment in the classroom, you have to be vulnerable. You have to maybe make a few mistakes yourself and you have to bring out the artistic and the emotional side of you. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a very, that's actually a very great question because I, I do think about this sometimes. Like when I reflect back on my behavior in a classroom, sometimes I feel, was it really necessary to, to be so human when you're just trying to deliver a message across? And then there are other days when I go like, well, if, if, the students can see me being human wouldn't they also you know get the strength to be vulnerable in the same context and i understand why in the medical sciences everyone always speaks about life and death life and death so you have to be stoic and you know you have to you, there is no place for emotions and i am constantly torn between what philosophy do we use here so uh yes i am in fact i would like to know the answer what do you think sir uh, what are your views on this yeah, I agree with you actually that we need a reform, um, a human, a humanistic or uh, an art reform uh, in in medical education, particularly because that's that's what I do and where that's where we're involved in primarily, in the sense that we say it all the time that uh, our students will we're trying to develop them to be more, um, uh, you know, emotionally and culturally aware yeah. we're trying to teach them all these soft as we call them softer skills to be more to communicate with the patients better to be able to uh, relate you know to be able to have a good bed side skills and manner and all of that, that those are the human things that you know that this kind of that bringing out that art in them bringing out that feeling part of them will develop you know, and so I am 100% in favor of, you know, introducing some part of, let's say, contextualizing our education in that way to, to make it more, uh, more human, to make it more relatable uh, so that our students, when they become physicians or clinicians, they, they actually get in touch with that part of themselves. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's almost... It's almost as if it's frowned upon when a patient, a patient is in your in your offices and is telling a story. It's almost like you have to keep that distance professionally. And, and I understand that. I get it because you cannot be too involved, so, not so that you are not able to help the patient any longer. But yeah. some part of empathy also demands that you show some emotion. And uh, yeah, we need to do more. We need to do better in that res that regard. All right, we are kind of rounding up our um, chat with you, Dr. Z, today, and uh, wonder whether uh, Claudia, you want have some questions? Always. So, so neat. As you know, are we always wrap up our podcast asking our guests, "What's your favorite body part?" Oh, for me, it has to be the brain. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And uh, well, I just feel we know so little and every five years somebody comes up with something that makes you rethink everything. And uh, I like that. I like, I like to constantly feel that I know nothing because uh, I just, for the longest time I struggled with that concept and now it's just home. I just feel at home when I, when I realize I know very little about something and the brain always makes me feel like that. So definitely. That's so beautiful uh, to kind of frame the brain as the one place we know so little about. And that makes it so exciting. Yeah. Um, with that said, what's your least favorite body part? Oh, I've got three. <laughs> <laughs> I've got three. Uh, the first one's the lacrimal gland. And not that I have a problem with like crying, but uh, 
it was just something that I never studied for my for my masters because you know I thought it's probably not as important and it showed up in my paper and that has so there's a very direct correlation between why I it, it, do you pronounce it as lacrimal or lacrimal lacrimal yeah. lacrimal yeah. yeah lacrimal gland is one uh, the other one is uh, the the bet the other one. Sorry, did hmm. you cry when you saw the lacrimal gland on your exam? <laughs> I kind of did. It was just poetic, right? It was very like, oh, there we go. Oh, how am I doing this? Oh, the lacrimal gland is making me do this. Whoa, looks like I should have read about it. So yeah, that did happen. Uh, the the second one is uh, the perineal musculature. Okay. For whatever reason, I don't know. I tried to get along with it, but we just don't get along. You know, we don't quite talk to each other except if I have to like teach it then I just have to go through the table and like make some mnemonic and go ahead and get done with it and no songs are sung in that lecture let me tell you <laughs> it's not my favorite thing to, to teach and the last one's the extra hepatic biliary apparatus again I don't know I just don't see it I I I, I don't like the way it is I mean and I no disrespect like I love the gallbladder uh, I'm fascinated by the liver, but all the things that are connecting them to each other, eh, I'm like, okay, whatever, whatever works for you. <laughs> Not a big fan. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, and uh, that's so interesting. And Claudia couldn't resist uh, pulling a lacrimal, yeah. <laughs> a lacrimal there. It was uh, right there. It was right there for the picking. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you so much, um, Sunit, for sharing your expertise, your wonderful love of anatomy and cross link that with your passion for the arts and for music. It's been a fascinating uh, 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 talking with you um, session, talking with you today. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. And I hope that this will become sort of a rallying cry for us all to include more arts into our teaching practice, especially when it comes to teaching about the human body, which doesn't really separate between these parts of our life. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And uh, I hope that I can contribute in whatever way I can to, you know, make the arts and the sciences marry each other because the offspring that comes out of that, I think that's the future of education. Amazing. Thank you. And that wraps up another episode of Body Banter. We'll be connecting again on the airwaves next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.